You are watching DHTV from California State University, Dominguez Hills. Welcome back to NCR 525. I'm Dr. Pamela Kreiser, and this is our course about mediation. Today, we are going to cover four different topics as we continue to lay the foundation for our education and mediation. First, we're going to talk about the stages of mediation. Then we'll talk about the intake process, which is part of our pre-mediation. We'll cover the first stage of mediation, which is the opening statement. And then we'll also um, take a look at an interview that I conducted with a mediator. So to start, we want to think about the stages of mediation. Now, if you have any education in mediation, you know that there are lots of different perspectives on how many stages there are. I tend to teach the five-stage model of mediation. And so I talk about those stages as the opening, the storytelling and issue identification, building the agenda, negotiation and problem solving, and then writing and testing the settlement agreement. And we're going to go through each of those ideas specifically. Um, of course, in today's lecture, we'll talk about the opening statement more specifically. But before we do any of that, I want you to take a look at this video by Edward Nelson as he looks through the stages of mediation from his perspective. All right, my name's Edward Nelson, and this is the pictorial representation of what a mediator does in a mediation. Okay? The first thing that a mediator does is set the boundaries. Okay? So this is like a petri dish, and in the middle we have guess what? An amoeba. Okay? The way this works is that we set out the guidelines, a process, we outline the process and the principles of mediation. Within that context, this takes any shape. The content is up to the parties. It takes any shape that they want. Okay? Now, after that happens, the next thing that goes on is we give them some space to vent. Okay? So this is something that's becoming out of date now and I was doing some work with kids the other day and they didn't know what it was and it wasn't just my drawing. It's a pressure cooker, okay? And so the next stage that happens is after we've sent it is they need to vent and they need to let off steam. You know, there's been a fire cooking under here, been a lot of pressure being built up and we need to facilitate a space for them to let off some steam, okay? Now, while that's happening, we, this is like a, a 1950s radar sweeping around. Now, if you know these things, they, they do beeps. Beep, 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 beep. Tracking mining, tracking different, tracking things that you can't necessarily see or aren't obvious in its sweep around. So every time we hear a beep, we notice that's an issue. We're listening for the issues. What are the things that are really important? And as they talk, you'll hear it come up again. Beep, beep, beep. So this is, the, this is the radar. This is, like, this is what we do as they're talking, as they're venting, as things are going on. Okay. The next thing that happens, we start to choose to focus on these issues. We've got to make a decision about which, which issue we want to look at. Okay. So here we have a... You can, if you were able to respond to me, you'd be guessing what this was right now. This is, this is where we want to get them to. And this is a big boulder blocking them on their road to wherever it is they're going. We don't know where they're going yet, but right now some of these issues are getting in the way. Okay? So we've got one big issue, possibly, and we've got two, three, four smaller issues on the side. Now what can happen is that we can get caught up in this one big issue, and it might be so big that we can't do anything about it, and it's disheartening. So one approach is to decide to focus on some of the little issues and build up some momentum and show that they can actually work through something. When that happens, they can start tackling the bigger issue. However, it might work the other way around, and usually it does. There's one big issue in the middle, and we tackle that, the rest aren't important. They can sort themselves out. If they work that on out, one, two, three, and four, they're a piece of cake. They're not even important anymore. So how do we do that once we've, once we've gone through? Well, Every choice that they make about how they're going to solve that, it's a bit like a, um, a little mouse here. Um, well, excuse, my, excuse my drawing, but uh, this is a, a makeshift maze. Okay? And we want to get this mouse out of the maze, and we want to get the mouse for the cheese. 
okay? I know it's a pretty stock standard thing. I could have said peanut butter, apparently like that as well, but we want to get the mouse through there to what they want, okay? They might be making some choices that are taking them towards, say, the rat trap, okay? The mouse trap, okay? They're going to get caught, or famously, the mog, the cat, something like that. You want to take them down the route and explore with them which one of them is going to be the best option for them to do to solve those issues. And for each one of those issues, you want to take them out through this process. So here's the mouse here. We're going to, we're going to guide them. So that's, uh, in a nutshell, the visual pictorial representation of what happens in mediation. Now, they don't necessarily all happen in that order. You can go cycle around. You might find that you move back up and they've got to do a bit more venting and you hear a bit more about another issue as they've been working on this. But predominantly, that's the kind of overall theme of the way you want it to go. Okay? That is the stages of mediation. As you can see, he uses lots of humor to show us the serious side of mediation, but through a fun way of looking at it. Now, when you think about the stages of mediation, of course, as I identified, the five stages of mediation is the model that I do. But it really doesn't matter actually how you slice it up as long as you hit all of the parts. Now, let's take a look at this next clip where you'll see noticeably that the stage three that I talk about isn't included. Let's take a look at Jean Monroe's mediation. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank you for being here today and welcome you. Um, please call me Jean. Uh, and what may I call you? I'm Sally. Sally, and I know you're attorney. Hello, Paul. Nice to have you back again. And you are? I'm Harry. Harry. Good to meet you, Harry. Thank and is it okay if we call you Harry? It is. And, of course, I know you're an attorney as well. Hello, Dan. How are you today? Uh, I want to uh, welcome you and, and make you feel as comfortable as possible. We have water on the table. There's coffee and tea over here on the sideboard if you need it. The restroom's around the hall on the left, so at any time if you need a break, just let me know and we'll certainly accommodate that. And while we're talking about that, does anybody have any special needs? Medication you have to take at a certain time or time restraints? No. If, you, if there are, let me know because we'll certainly be able to accommodate you. Uh, I think you've made a really good choice to come to mediation today. I understand that the two of you have a son, Billy, and I'm sure that Billy is important to each of you. And being able to do this here in a private um, way, a confidential way, will certainly take a lot of the pressure off of your son. So you've made a wise choice to be in mediation. The um, courts are over -doc docketed, as you know, and you may have to wait months before you get heard. And then uh, the judge is only going to be able to give you a day or a portion of a week to do it. And the things that you'd like to have said, you may not be able to say because of the rules of evidence. But in here, the each, each of you can say everything you need to say, and you can be heard. And I think that's very important because I'm sure with the, uh, the preparation for the trial, you probably haven't had an opportunity to hear each other. And that's my role. My role is to guide you and help you hear each other and communicate, help you explore all the options possible to work out the remaining issues, and come to a resolution that will fit you, uh, Harry, and you, Sally, and uh, most of all, your son, Billy. So again, congratulations for this choice. My credentials are that I'm a Rule 31 mediator uh, approved by the Tennessee Supreme Court. I am a mediation trainer, and I have been a mediator since 1992. I'm also a lawyer, but I will not be wearing my lawyer hat today. You have very fine counsel uh, to uh, do that for you today. And at any time that your lawyer needs to talk to you or you need to talk to your lawyer, feel free to let me know and, and we'll arrange that. Uh, by the same token, if you would like to talk to me alone in a private session, we can arrange that. And whatever you tell me there will also be confidential. The, um, there are several rules that make this work better. As I mentioned, it's confidential. So um, nothing that is said in here can be used against you in court, nor can anyone subpoena me to go to court to testify. Let me ask you if the two of you as well would like to keep this confidential. Yes. Yes. Very good. So we already have our first agreement. The second uh, rule is that 
it's we would ask for your full honesty and disclosure of anything that might help us resolve this case and you'll agree to that as well sir all right thank you the third agreement is uh, voluntary we uh, may be here under court order but the decision that you make will be your own no one can coerce you not neither your attorney nor I nor anyone else it's going to be your voluntary decision so the two of you will be the decision makers uh, but if at any time you feel that you would like to leave this process that is your choice you may do so I would just ask you a favor we agree to stop and speak with me in a private session first to see if there's some way we can put this back together because I think you'd be leaving a very valuable process would you agree to do that sure and and would you all right and then the last one is mutual respect we've already agreed to talk to each other about using first names um, I would like to ask that you speak only from your own perspective rather than tell me what Harry thinks or what he's up to uh, just tell me what's important to you what you need and rather than tell me what her motivation is tell me what you'd like to see happen in the future uh, I also ask you to be open-ended and flexible uh, open-minded and flexible um, your attorneys are going to have a little different role today than they have in court I'm sure you hire them because they're uh, aggressive attorneys who will do a good job for you in court but this is not an adversarial process so we're going to ask them to do something that lawyers are very good at and that's be quiet and if any time though that you need to talk with them you may do so but the two of you are going to be doing the talking today so is everybody good on that sure. all right let's go um, let me explain a little bit about the four steps we're almost through the introductory step the introduction the second piece, I'll be hearing from each of you about what's important to you today, what your goals and concerns are, and what you'd like to achieve at the end of the day. Then we will throw up as many options as we can think of on this chart, and maybe the ones that you haven't even thought of before. And there are no bad ones, we'll put the good ones, the bad ones, whatever. And out of that we'll find ones that will work for you, and we'll write them up and that'll be the fourth step. And you'll have an agreement that your attorneys can review, you can sign off on and you'll be done it'll be over so are you good to go yes and how about you yes. well if that's so let's uh, pass this agreement to mediate around and where are we going so Harry um, you are concerned about whether or not Sally can afford the house can you tell me a little bit more about that well, sure. I've always been the one that, that earned the income. She works, but her income doesn't justify a home like we live in. And her comment that she'd like to keep the home and have a suitable home for Billy really is impractical. She knows she can't make enough, even with the child support, to sustain that house without having to go get another job or something. And, and if she does that, who watches Billy? I do she, agree that it would be very hard. Mm -hmm. and that I would need a higher paying job. Um, I, I hope that I might be a little more qualified than, um, than, we, than Harry gives than you credit we, for. Yes. We have a lot of equity in that house, but it still has a substantial mortgage on it, and the payments have to be made. And I don't want to lose that house because she gets it in the divorce settlement and then can't afford the mortgage payments, and she gets behind and who's going to save the house? She'll come running to me. So one of your solutions is either to get a better job or a second job. Do you have any ideas for making this economically feasible? Other than selling the house, you mean? Okay, so selling the house would be uh, your choice. Selling the house and dividing the uh, equity. And then we could both have a, a nice home. So option five would be to delay for a, a period of time paying him his portion. Mm -hmm. I know that would seem hard. I'll so agree. what could you do with this proposal that might make it more palatable to him? Can you think of something that might make him willing to delay? Put our heads together and see if we can think outside the box and come up with some kind of an answer. 
I wonder, uh, Billy is 13, I understand, so right. he has five more years of minority. Um, anything to do with that? Well, the desire that we're talking about is that Billy would have a nice home with her and a nice home with me. And Well, congratulations, Harry and Sally. We reached a complete agreement on all the issues, and uh, it seems like an agreement that you both can live with and feel good about. And let's review it, and I have written it out here um, that you can follow on our, uh, the flip chart that we've done. Um, you've already agreed on the co-parenting time and the child support before you came. Uh, today, we've agreed that each of you will pay half of the mortgage for the next eight months to give Sally time to get into this new job that she believes that she'll have. She will attempt to refinance the house within that eight months, but if she's unable to do so, uh, she's agreed to sell the house and attempt to find another house in the same school district so she can accomplish it. So is that the totality of your agreement? That sounds right. And you're both be willing to be bound by it? Yes. All right, I have written that out here, and I will pass it around for everybody to sign, and we'll be done. And then your attorneys will take this memorandum of understanding and put it in legalese and, uh, and present it to the court for the court signature, and everything will be finished. So, again, congratulations. Well, thank you. I appreciate what you did today. You're welcome. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Jean. And thank you, Paul. As you can see, Jean Monroe combines stage two and three together to make uh, a four-stage model. But when you think about all the different ways to slice up mediation, it's really about are you making progress with the parties? Are you helping them get toward that written agreement? And so I would challenge you to think about the idea of the progress bar. Now, when you and I fill out surveys, we see that progress bar at the top of that survey. And what it tells us is how far along we are in that process. Think about mediation in the same way. When I think about the progress bar, I think about are we hitting all of the necessary steps and are we continuing to make progress? Now that is something you'll hear a lot more about later from my perspective. The importance of the mediator using the progress bar as a tool to gauge whether the mediation's working and also as a way to narrate that to the disputants. So for example, I'm going to watch the progress bar while I communicate with my disputants and then I'm also going to reflect off the progress bar to my disputants if we aren't making progress. Like for example, I might say in stage four, we're not, um, entertaining any more new solutions at this point. And so I want everyone to go back to the drawing board and try to think of additional solutions because we haven't been making any more progress. Remember, that's what I call narrating off of the progress bar. And this is the idea that you and I need to, as mediators, monitor the interaction level that we're working on with the parties, but also that meta-communication level, which we call that progress bar, which is how we see the interaction progressing. And that is something that we do instead of the interactants because we are the facilitators of the session. Now, one thing I want to comment on right here before we get into um, some other topics is the idea that sometimes mediators try to look for like a perfect way to do something. So for example, I like the five-stage model. Jean Monroe likes the four-stage model. Like everybody has all their different perspectives. And you'll read from every different mediator that they have different ideas of how this all goes. But what I would suggest is I don't think there is a right way. I don't think there is a perfect uh, way to do mediation. It's inherently an imperfect process. This idea that you and I would communicate with parties and have all kinds of unknown variables present in the interaction, um, it would be impossible to have a perfect mediation. Now let's move our discussion to mediator supplies. Now this is something that is very much under control. While I talked about interaction being out of control, the idea of using um, or being prepared for mediation is something that is under the mediator's control. So I would ask you to think about the context where you're going to be mediating. When you think about the supplies you might need, you want to think about what type of mediation you're doing, how long the mediation will happen, and what kinds of um, settings that you'll be in. And so sometimes we know that we need to bring a calculator, for example. I would highly recommend that to most mediations. You might want to bring Kleenex. You might want to bring water. You might want to bring uh, notepads for people to take notes. Um, perhaps you need to have snacks available if you're talking about a long mediation. 
the idea of having the right supplies sets up the mediation session for success. Um, there have been many times where I have needed a supply where I haven't necessarily had it. Not necessarily because I was out of my control or under my control, but just I either forgot or it wasn't available. So take the example of someone starting to cry in a mediation. It doesn't really work not to have Kleenex available. You need it. And so uh, I like to have all of those supplies available whenever I can. Now, one thing to tell you is that I mentioned a moment ago the calculator. And I had a mediation one time where the uh, parties both had Excel spreadsheets. It was a landlord-tenant mediation. And they both had spreadsheets. And they both handed me the spreadsheets to look at. And I noticed that the math didn't look correct. Now, I happen to have my calculator because that's something I carry with me. And so I did all of the addition for both of the spreadsheets, and both of the spreadsheets were wrong. I was kind of surprised because it was on Excel. But what was interesting about that was I asked them, I said, so you ran this through Excel? And they said, no, 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 no. We put the numbers on Excel. We added them ourselves. Now, that's not how I typically use Excel, but it's what they did. And so I was able to um, verify those numbers back to them after we added them again together. And then we had the real numbers we were talking about in the mediation. The next item to talk about is the area of pre-mediation. And that really comes down to two main areas. When we're talking about pre-mediation, we're talking about the intake process. And then I'll make additional comments about the idea of convening. So let's talk about the intake process. Um, most professions have an intake type of form or a process. Um, so if you see a counselor, you do an intake meeting. If you go to the doctor, you get a form that talks about your symptoms or the issues that are at hand. And so that's the same thing in mediation, where we might um, be contacted by a party who requests mediation, and then we would do what is called intake on that inquiry. What does that mean? Well, it means that you and I would ask for demographic information to try to understand the parties, and then we'd also find out about the nature of the dispute. This is where we'd ask some initial questions, not in-depth questions, but initial questions about the conflict. Now, we're trying to figure out a couple different things here. One is we're trying to figure out if the uh, conflict is suitable for mediation. So there are some cases where the law needs to be involved. And there's some cases where minor children are involved. And so we might uh, make a determination of a better suited agency than our own to serve in mediation. And so that is something to really think about uh, because we don't want to suggest that all parties are um, going to benefit from mediation. We know that a lot of parties will benefit from mediation, but we wouldn't go as far as to say everything can be mediated. That would be um, a silly thing to say because we know that there are many other forms of communication that would be suitable and other agencies that might be able to provide very excellent services. So you're trying to figure out if the mediation is suitable for, or if the dispute is suitable for mediation. And then you're also trying to figure out um, information about the disputants. And sometimes that means that we need to figure out, is, um, is this going to serve the disputants equally? Uh, is there a language barrier? Is there an interpreter needed? Um, is there a consequence that, uh, regarding work or um, any other uh, possible power difference in the mediation? Um, as we're thinking about all of those, we're asking questions to try to figure out who can best serve these people. And so then we're also trying to get the information of the other party and finding out if we can contact them. And so we would be able to know um, if they had understood that mediation was an option and perhaps what they thought about it. Um, and then we might pursue that call after that. So the intake process really is qualifying the dispute and seeing if it's suitable for mediation. Now the next thing we want to talk about that's part of that intake process is the idea of conven convening. And let's look at this clip by Bruce Edwards who talks about it. Most of the lessons I've learned about the importance of convening, indeed most of the checklist items I routinely cover with parties and convening conference calls, are the direct result of what I refer to as bloody nose moments early in my career. By that I mean at a time when I failed to realize the importance of pre-mediation conversations to troubleshoot issues, and I rushed through to the negotiation process, I encountered problems that would have been vetted through better planning. As a result, the parties were frustrated, and I was often forced to spend a considerable amount of time making up for my lack of attention in the convening stage. It might have been something as simple as not having the right decision maker present, 
or the wrong size room available to comfortably host an unexpectedly large group. More often, a bloody nose moment occurred when one side didn't get something through discovery they'd been promised, such as a document, an opportunity for an expert to view the site, or some other prerequisite to completing their evaluation, which resulted in an aborted mediation early in the process. Here, the old adage proves true time and again. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. When we talk about the idea of convening, we need to understand that it really involves two different types of ideas. One is that we're educating the parties and also that we're selling the parties on the process. Now, selling doesn't mean that we're manipulating people. It just means that we're specifying the benefits. So let's think about some of the aspects that are involved in convening as we think about it. Um, the first really most important concept is self-determination. This idea that the parties who are part of this uh, mediation need to understand that they determine the outcomes. They determine the issues that we talk about. They determine what gets on our list of things to solve. And they ultimately determine what is written in the agreement. Now, we call this self-determination because it's different from the idea of going in front of a judge. Remember, in last session, we talked about adjudication, the idea that someone would decide something for you. Alternatively, mediation is where the parties decide it for themselves. So what are we doing? We're third-party neutral facilitators. We're doing the job to help them have that self-determination. Now, there are a couple things that come with that responsibility. One is confidentiality. That you and I, when we're doing an opening and when we're talking with parties as we initiate a mediation, we want to think about the idea of confidentiality. This idea that when we're engaging in the mediation process, that what happens in mediation stays in mediation. And so we make sure that there isn't any identifiable information that's talked about. We make sure that um, we have a separate process from adjudication so that um, we're ensuring that these parties have a safe place to exercise that self-determination. Now, of course, in all of that, we have to define the roles. So my role as a neutral third-party facilitator and their role as con active contributors towards their own solutions. Now, of course, that means that we end up getting into a discussion of what mediation is and what, what it is not. So that is something that I do when I'm opening a mediation with my um, with the people that I serve, I am defining what it is and what it isn't. Um, sometimes parties will ask me, well, what would you do? Just tell us what to do. Sometimes parties will say that to me. And I'll redefine my role for them and say, that's not my role to tell you what to do. My role is to help you think about what you want to do. And so I'm always reflecting that role back to them in order to clarify the process that's in front of us. The other day I did a mediation and um, part of our mediation in that particular program in the court was that they had to fill out a demographic form. And so when I was assessing the, the dispute for um, candidacy for mediation, I noticed on the demographic form that the party who, had, uh, who was the defendant said his main goal to go to mediation was to win. And he put W-I-N in all caps with an exclamation point. Now, we know that's not what mediation is. Um, but that was his perspective, which would need clarifying in the convening process. Um, that's the educational side of what we're talking about, to help parties understand what this process is and what it can do. And then parties can, because of that education, determine if mediation is right for them. Now let's also think about the selling side, where we said that part of convening is this idea that I sell uh, the process of mediation. Now, you heard me earlier say it's not manipulation. I'm not trying to sell something or oversell something that isn't really suitable. Um, but when I find a, a, part, a set of parties that could be helped, I'm going to tell them the benefits. And so part of that is very important for you as a mediator to understand uh, what your selling points are. So when we're talking about different contexts, there are different um, outcomes that might affect the parties. Um, I've had mediations where I've had parties who were told if they don't work it out, they're going to be fired. So one of the benefits of mediation to them is that they can get this resolved and go forward in the workplace. Um, it's a benefit to both of them. Um, we know that when we settle um, in mediation outside of the legal process, we know that that reduces the legal consequences. And so that might be a selling point that you can use in terms of mediation. But again, they're going to vary context to context. And so as you as a mediator who is doing the convening process, you're going to think through what are the benefits inherent in this system and what might be useful to the parties or something that they want in order to get them to engage actively in this potentially very helpful process.
So as we're talking about the five stages of mediation, we want to think about how we're going to specifically explore the first stage, which is the opening. Now, as you look at those stages of mediation, we know that the opening is really sets the table for the rest of the session. So there are a number of things that you need to do in terms of mediation to set that table. Now, this is um, the part where we actually sit down to do the mediation, and it's the very first part of our engagement with the disputants. So there are about 15 different things that we need to do in terms of that opening statement. Now, one of your tasks as a mediator will be to develop an opening statement, one that you type out and that you can change depending on the context, but that you would have one or two or three standard opening statements that you would provide for the, you know, that you would go over with the parties. So here are some of the things that I think need to be in that opening statement document. First of all, you want to welcome the people to your mediation. And so you want to welcome them to the session and you want to introduce each other. Now, I am interested in being called Pamela in a mediation, and so I will also ask the parties what they would like to be referred to as. So I would ask them, is it okay to refer to you by your first name? Most parties say yes. Occasionally, some parties say no. But it is important to figure that out so that you can use that going forward in the session in a way that is productive. In other words, you don't want to call someone a first name who doesn't want to be called that, and you certainly don't want to call someone by Mr. or Ms., um, when they want to be addressed by their first name. So clarify that right off. One of the other key things that we need to do is to figure out if we have the right people in the room. Now this we call verifying stakeholders. It means that we're looking for who are the stakeholders and who are the decision makers. So when I do a, an insurance liability uh, mediation, I'm looking for who is going to be able to authorize payment. I'm looking for people who can make actual decisions. Um, and sometimes people play games with me about that. Um, I had a case recently where they said they couldn't make a decision and then ultimately had a check they happened to have available and paid that check right on the spot. So, um, you know, you have to kind of figure that out if you have the right people in the room. I hedged on that mediation a little bit to see if we, I thought we had the right people and it turns out we did, um, but maybe that's based on my experience. So it's something you'll want to watch as you go forward. Um, you want to explain the nature and the scope of mediation. So you want to explain basically what uh, mediation is. You want to talk about it as a structured conversation. You want to help people understand what it isn't, which we talked about a minute ago. And so you want to help your parties overall kind of have a general sense of mediation and what it's like and what it might do for them. Um, you're going to explain the mediator's role. So that is where I clarify, here's my role, here's what I do and what I don't do. And um, what I'll say is I'm here to help you. I'm here to help the process work in a structured way. Um, what I won't do is offer you solutions, and what I won't do is tell you whether they're good solutions or not. I will simply guide you as you engineer your own solutions. Um, I'll explain in my opening statement what a caucus is. Now, a caucus, uh, just so you know, is when we break into private meetings with the parties. So what does that mean? Well, I'm breaking into a private session uh, with the parties for a specific reason. Now, as we think about this, um, you would just not explain that part of it, but you would explain that it might be necessary for us to break the, up the format and meet privately, and I'll let you know when we're going to do that. The mediator should definitely, in the opening, define um, the impartiality and neutrality part of the mediator's role. And you heard me talking about that already. It's something that I need to continually remind my disputants about. The idea that I don't have a stake in it. I'm not interested in a certain outcome. I'm not trying to get it done or not done, and I'm not trying to get one person something and another person not something. I'm neutral, I'm impartial, I facilitate. We talk a lot in the opening statement about confidentiality, and you heard me talk about this a little bit um, last time, and I'm gonna talk about it this time as well. Uh, we think about confidentiality as this idea that mediation is a confidential process. Now, when you think about confidential, if you hear it from the disputant's point of view, they hear that idea of confidentiality as you're going to keep my secrets. And I don't mind that idea. I think that is how they see confidentiality. Um, but how I see confidentiality as a mediator is that I, it is my job to provide a protected space for the disputants to talk through their issues that won't affect any other system. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that if they choose to go to trial, with, if our mediation doesn't work out and they go to trial, that what happened in mediation stays in mediation. In other words, what we've discussed, proposed, 
questioned, um, offered, all those things we don't use in a, a different setting. And so that's how I like to explain uh, the confidentiality part to them so that they're aware that that is a separate process. Um, the other day I had a very private matter in a mediation that I conducted in civil harassment. And the party was very interested in the idea that his personal business was not discussed in a public forum. And that would be like in a civil harassment case. So he was very interested in mediating um, because of that confidential nature of the mediation itself. Now, something I tell my parties is that I am going to be taking notes. But sometimes people, given the sensitive nature of what we're talking about, um, are un comfortable with the idea of taking notes. So I assure them that I'm taking notes so I can find the relevant information, but I also will destroy the notes at the end of the session. And so I make sure parties know that these notes aren't being taken for any other purpose. It's not like I'm taking notes so that I can give them to someone. Now I, as a mediator, will tend to establish ground rules. And this is sort of an interesting judgment call depending on the context and the parties. So. This is something that I was asked the other day by one of the, the interns that I'm training in mediation. Um, this intern said, well, how do you know how many ground rules to lay down in that opening? I noticed you only really laid down one. So what had happened was I noticed that the parties were a little pretty combative when we first got into the session. And so it was, became apparent that explaining that interruptions will not be allowed was one of the ground rules we better talk about. So I stopped and said, before we get into mediation, I want to make sure you realize that we have certain ground rules. And the main ground rule we have to watch for today is the idea that we are using structured conversation. That also means that we can't talk over each other. Now, sometimes I'll also do this if we have an interpreter. Uh, many cases that I do involve interpreters, and it doesn't work to have people talking over each other when we have an interpreter in that environment. So that would also be a reason to talk about no interrupting as a ground rule. Now, another example might be where a party sits down to mediation and whips out their, to their phone. And uh, one of my ground rules is there's no phones allowed unless it is important to the mediation process. And so I ask parties to turn their phones off and to put them away. Now, normally I don't include that in my opening statement, but I might include it if they suddenly did it in the mediation session when we initiated. So some of what you'll need to do is determine what is always going to be in your opening statement in terms of ground rules, and what are some of the rules you might pull out when it becomes necessary. So you heard me thinking about the context, looking at the people, understanding our challenges, and then identifying um, what those ground rules might best serve them be. And, and should we talk about those formally, or should I only talk about them when you break my rule? One other thing to say is that sometimes I do mediations with lots of parties in the room. I did one recently with seven parties in the room. And that, I thought, was important to talk about interrupting, not interrupting, and also that certain parties wouldn't be speaking when other parties were speaking. And that it was important that we speak one at a time and only under the, the uh, direction of my facilitation of the mediation. Um, we also established the time frame for parties. So expectations are kind of interesting for human beings. Um, we like them, but if you make an expectation for a human and then you fail to meet it, then we don't like that as humans. And you already know that. So think carefully through how long you think the mediation might happen or need to happen. And you want to think also about the expected time frame. So is this mediation going to go one to two hours and then we'll take a break? Or will it go four hours and we'll take a break? Um, set the expectations for your parties, but do it realistically so that you don't dash their expectations. Um, we want to talk in the opening statement about outside experts. Now, there's sometimes there are mediations where people um, will be consult consulting outside parties. Uh, could be an attorney, could be some other kind of expert. And so what I like to do is keep high levels of control in my mediations. So I don't say, well, if you need to contact someone, go ahead. I say, if you need to contact someone, please ask me, and I will let you know when there's an appropriate time to do that. Notice how I do it retains a lot of control. That's different than some other mediators who might be very comfortable with someone jumping up and down. What I find, in my experience, is it doesn't work very well. It doesn't work very well to have people be making all kinds of different, unstructured activities or behaviors when I'm trying to run a very structured session. And then the last thing that we'll do is transition into what we call storytelling. Of course, we don't say, tell your story. But what we do is we ask uh, individuals why we're here, 
or sometimes when I do civil harassment cases, I ask parties to provide five or six sentences about why they believe we are here today. So as you think about all of those things that I described in the opening statement, remember all of those items, all of those areas or dimensions are going to be part of your opening statement. And so you'll put each of those in and you'll have it be um, wording that represents how you want to conduct your mediation. But at the end of the day, there's one more important factor that you must consider. You have to find your voice. So I train over 100 mediators a year. I have about 40 interns in court a year that I train. And I am not ever training them to become me. I'm training them to become them. And so I want you to think seriously about that. Because sometimes when we borrow phrasing from other sources or, or we think about, oh, this, this should be good or sounds like someone else said it, um, the problem I have with importing language that doesn't belong to you is the idea that it doesn't sound like you. And so inherently, we become ro robotic if we don't actually follow our own voice. And so part of what is um, demanding about creating an opening statement is it really demands that we put all of these things in our own terms. Um, and I would also caution you not in too high of a level uh, of education. So because we serve the general public largely, I would suggest to you that we need to use simple language, language that you think most people could understand. Um, simplify the process for the parties because that's the way you'll actually help them. And you want to make sure that's always on your mind as a mediator. I move them through the progress bar, but my main idea is to help them in every way that I possibly can. So as we put all of these opening statements together, we have to find our voice, we have to have all the key components, and then we're ready to go. So what does that mean? We have to practice. And as we practice, we can change the language. That's why I said to type it. Change the language, make edits, and finally get it to a place where it represents how we feel um, is best suited for our voice as mediators. So the next part, um, I want to just show a couple of examples for, of some opening statements. So let's take a look at this first one. Good morning. Katie, Andy, it's nice of you to be here. I'm Mark. I'm your mediator. I know that you have been asked by MBC to come to this mediation, and I appreciate the fact that you're here. You should know that mediation is both voluntary and confidential. That basically means that even though your company has encouraged you to be here, if this doesn't work for you, you can either one of you leave at any time, and there is no penalty involved in that. It will simply be a mediation in which the, the, it didn't work out at that point in time. Now, by voluntary, I mean that I'm going to treat your participation as somebody who wants to be here and is looking for a solution. By confidential, I mean that anything we say here stays here. The only thing that can leave this room by law is any written agreement that you may reach. And I say may because you're under no compulsion to reach an agreement while we're in mediation. My role is to help the two of you talk. I don't make decisions. I don't tell you what to do. I'm here as a facilitator of your discussion. I'm a neutral. I've been hired by MBC for this process. I don't work for them. I have no allegiance one way or the other to them other than helping you guys do this process. As you can see, this is an example of an opening statement. But you probably noticed that it doesn't include all of the ideas that I talked about before. It doesn't include certain things. Um, I still think that you should probably include many of the things that I talked about, but think about what you want to include. Uh, how do you think about it? You think what's most important for helping the parties get the best outcomes possible. Well, let's look at another opening statement now. This is from um, Thomas Meyer, and let's take a look at his opening. Hello, my name is Tom Meyer, and I'll be your mediator here today. Um, if this is your first time mediating, uh, let me say it's very normal to come into the room with doubt, uh, skepticism, and perhaps a very, very low expectation as to what might be accomplished uh, when you consider that I am not a judge and that I will not be making any rulings or determinations about who's obligated to pay or recover anything as a result of what we discuss uh, here today. Most people uh, 
would rather simply avoid mediation and continue to pursue their case and, and get to trial. However, uh, most people are also engaging in that strategy without knowledge of the facts. And the most important fact that they're not, most people are not aware of is that the overwhelming majority of lawsuits, meaning over 90% of the lawsuits filed throughout the United States, never get to trial and end up out of court. It's just a fact that somewhere along the way, most litigants find a better way to resolve their dispute and have to take it out of court. Um, it's my job today to see if we could come up with a better resolution for you to also take your dispute out of court. So as you can see, there are a few different approaches, and yours will be even a third or a fourth as you develop your opening statement. So just keep in mind, what are we generally trying to do? We're trying to get some trust, some rapport. We're trying to share some information. We're trying to share the benefits of mediation. We're trying to get buy-in from the parties so that the parties can really be served by mediation. And as we do that, then we clarify the process of neutrality, impartiality, uh, confidentiality. All those things will be um, understood, and we can move forward from that initial uh, point of contact, which is that opening statement. So after we get the agreement, and by the way, many agencies that I work in have a confidentiality agreement that parties have to sign, and so that might be part of your opening as well, is getting a confidentiality agreement signed. So sometimes we talk about it, sometimes we sign it. Uh, it'll just depend on who you're serving and what kind of formal or informal process you're mediating in. But as we think about it, um, we need to follow whatever the agency requirements um, that are set out for us to complete. So um, think about your opening statement, start working on that, start practicing it. That means that you actually have to, to orally say it. You can't just think about it or read it. It won't sound, you won't find your voice if you don't hear your voice. And so as you're practicing that, keep working on language that sounds like you. Now the next part of this, um, of this show includes an interview that I previously recorded with Wesley Acker. And Wesley is an experienced mediator who I interview and want to learn more about his experience so that you can benefit from it. Let's take a look. Welcome back. Today we have a special guest, Wesley Acker, who is a mediator in Orange County. Uh, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Glad to have you. Uh, we have uh, lots to talk about today regarding mediation. And so I appreciate your willingness to battle the traffic and come to the studio today. Yes, it was quite a battle. <laughs> it's always a battle out there. It's good that now that I'm here. Yeah, so um, I guess that tests the patience of, of, the, uh, of the driver, and maybe that's something that is important for mediation, too. I've been thinking about patience quite a bit. It's difficult to mediate a traffic jam. <laughs> yeah, you can't, they, you, no, no one controls the outcomes. To you, that's right. right. <laughs> yeah, so um, I want to start, and this is something I've known you for a while now. Um, I don't know your, uh, your background, um, how you became a mediator. Uh, tell us about that. Well, I was teaching uh, at university at um, Old Dominion in Virginia, and I happened to um, be working with someone that I hadn't worked with before and noticed on the end of her email that she was a mediator and, mediator and a trainer in mediation. Hmm. And I was curious. It always sounded like something interesting. So I found out she was part of a large uh, nonprofit. And within about a month, I started training to be a civil level mediator. And then I eventually went on to get my family certification as well. All in about nine months. It was kind of a quick journey. Yeah, and family is a whole nother. Uh, it is. We'll yeah. talk about that in a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, so you were in Virginia, mm -hmm. you did that training. Uh, then did mediation for profit, for nonprofit entirely? I, I donated my time to the nonprofit there, and I did that uh, quite, quite often, actually. I do probably two to three a, a week at times. Mm -hmm. um, it's nice being a professor at the time. I had a, some leisure, yeah. free time to, <laughs> to be used elsewhere. 
I don't know that we always have leisure Not always. time. I, I'm scared about that comparison, right. but yeah, okay. Uh, so you were a mediator in Virginia, mm -hmm. um, then you relocated at some point to California. I don't know if that was a straight line or not. Uh, it was. Okay, so when you relocated here, tell me, uh, one question I get all the time is what, what do you do if you've been educated out of state? Uh, how do you transfer that? Like, how does that work? So, so how does that work for you? Yeah, something that's positive about uh, how mediation is handled in Virginia, it is regulated by the state. So you become certified within the state to mediate anywhere. Um, and there isn't technically one uh, a certification here right. managed by the state or, or uh, handled. So that's always challenging because the first thing you want to do is be able to present your credentials. It's easy to get one from Virginia. If you're getting yours here in California, you're going to have to make sure the other state is able to receive your certificate here. Okay. So then do you, so the state of Virginia provided evidence to, well, you don't yeah. really have to provide it here or you, here, well, to and, certify your DERPA. Right. So under the DERPA agreement, I was, I, I worked with a nonprofit, OC Human Relations, and they, um, were okay with all of my materials, they saw my certificates, and the number of hours I'd put in to certify. Right, okay, and then um, your family mediation training, was that in Virginia, or was that? Uh, that was also Virginia. In Virginia, yeah. okay. And then what kind of cases did you do in that role? Uh, it would be divorce, uh, separation, uh, things like uh, adjusting child custody, uh, determining, uh, well, it was a unique situation because it's a Navy town. Mm. So there's a lot of deployment and divorce happens at strange times and in, mm. in short measure. And so we, we dealt with some interesting cases. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. And then, uh, so you were able to transfer both um, uh, certifications. I guess Correct. you had them at certifications in Virginia. Correct. So you're able to transfer both. Um, now, I guess from your story, it didn't sound like you always wanted to become a mediator, or did you? No, not at all. Uh, I, I actually uh, taught at university at uh, teaching dance, believe it or not. So the interesting thing was once I understood what mediation was, I realized teaching people to dance is almost the same thing. You're, okay. you're helping them have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And that's literally what a mediation is. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't know how to work together. Mm -hmm. And two people trying to dance is kind of challenging when they're first beginning. And guess what? They, they need to have a dance of, of their languages. They have to be able to work with each right. other. And, and one of the, the thoughts that occurs to me as you're explaining that is how skill-based both of them are. Absolutely. Uh, so Absolutely. I get the question all the time, and I, I'll ask you this question too. The question I get is, can everyone become a mediator? Whew. Good question. <laughs> uh, I think probably the most important thing you need to have is uh, the willingness to stay with the process and to be patient. Just like when you're driving on the 405. Just like that. <laughs> so maybe that's the training ground for the it patience really that has to happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, so one, one other question that I get quite a lot is, can someone make uh, mediation a career? Absolutely. Uh, especially nowadays, there's, there are types of mediation here in California, for instance, that the courts mandate that you go through a mediation process. So you could work for the county, let's say, uh, in that type of role. You can work for nonprofits. You can have a private practice. There's actually some pretty high level um, dispute resolution specialists mm -hmm. that would also be considered evaluative mediators. And that means they not only are going to get the parties together, but they're also going to kind of advise them. And it's a little more like an arbitration. Mm -hmm. In other words, you can find a career at some level mm -hmm. if this looks like it's something you want to do. If you're an evaluative mediator, do you need to be a lawyer? Depends on the type of mediation you're doing. Okay. <clears throat> the reason is evaluative simply means that the mediator is going to offer some type of expertise. They're going to evaluate the case on both sides mm -hmm. and then give advice. Okay. Even if they don't make the final decision, 
their job is to help nudge based on their experience. Okay. So, um, and, and I have talked about context with uh, my students and also on the show. Mm -hmm. um, it does seem that context is sort of everything. Kind of so, yeah. Because you have the different judges, you have the different systems, you have the different types of cases, right. different expectations. Um, you and I have served some of the same people um, in right. court, and some of them, as I've talked about in a previous show, um, will say, I order you to try mediation, which is a voluntary <laughs> activity, right? And right. so we've been, in, I think, in that same courtroom mm -hmm. doing that, and uh, that's always an interesting moment where they think, is this voluntary or is this not voluntary? Um, and then there's also, like you're describing, those types of cases where it's not a choice. You're going to right. try it first, right. uh, which is interesting. And, I, and people debate that quite a bit, like whether that's a good thing or not. Uh, and I would say it depends Yeah. because uh, you don't want to railroad people, but then you also, there's so many people that think they know what mediation is and then they don't really know what it is. Right, and I think it's appropriate that uh, officer of, of the court, a, a, you know, a judge, someone like that, can mandate them to try it. In Virginia, everybody that goes through a divorce is already sent to mediation. They have to give it a try. If they refuse to settle, that's up to them. But they don't go before a judge without seeing a mediator first. Okay. Um, all right, so let's switch gears a little bit. Okay. I want to ask you about your philosophy. Um, okay. Do you have a philosophy of mediation? Uh, Yes, you, you need to make sure that everybody is, is understanding it's in their interest to find a best solution for them rather than uh, feel like I need to win. Mm. So as a mediator, my job is to number one, keep putting things out there that helps them understand What's in your interest? What's going to actually help you? These are when people make a decision they're able to stick with. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they actually might recommend mediation to someone else. Mm -hmm. So how does that philosophy show up like in your interaction per se? Like you talked about putting things out there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I sort of think that all of us have a philosophy, whether we know it or not. And it shows up in our interactions, whether we like it or not. I agree. So... Um, how would you say that shows up like in your actual on the interaction level? Well, a lot of times what I'm doing is as I listen to their, their story, their case, so forth, I'm looking for those interests pretty quickly. And then I, as I restate, I might bring out how that, that opens things up for them if they take a look mm. at what's in their interest. Mm -hmm. I won't say, you know, it's really in your interest to do this. That's right. not my job to advise. Okay. But as I'm giving the information they gave me, mm -hmm. in a restate we call that, mm -hmm. I'll add, and it sounds like this, and they'll, and they'll start saying, and that's true, isn't it? <laughs> so you like highlight their own uh, yeah. idea for their own discovery in a way? It's right. like helping them discover it as right. an issue or as a component? Right. Okay. Not adding new information, right. simply pointing out something that's already in their interest. And you and I have talked at great length about neutrality. Right. Uh, so that obviously goes to that notion, I assume, or hear, that that's part of your philosophy, is to really stay neutral. Absolutely. And, I, and we talked about that it's voluntary. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a solid on that. I really feel like if a person feels under duress or being coerced somehow, then we need to stop the mediation until things can become more balanced. Mm -hmm. People make poor decisions when they're under yes. that feeling. Yes, okay. Um, so let's talk about family and divorce mediation. Uh, it's something that I don't specialize in. Uh, I know about it, but mm -hmm. not personally because I don't mediate in that court. Um, what are some things you could tell us, you know, for people like me who don't do that mediation, what are some things that are unique about it? What are some challenges that you face? Uh, what's your experience like in there? So a quick comparison to, let's say, civil cases over small claims. Uh, those have a limited amount of relationship between the parties most times, and it's about money. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the money may be a big factor in a divorce case, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, but the relationships have been ongoing, and there's been a 
potentially a lot of harm done one to the other. Mm -hmm. And you are not really there to heal or rectify those harms. Hmm. And that's challenging. Yeah. It can happen in a, in a hmm. mediation where they're both really willing to participate. It can happen. But it's not your responsibility. What you're, what you're asked to do is help them dissolve the relationship in a peaceful and hopefully most beneficial to the parties, including kids, which is always a big factor. So you're hoping for them to come up with the best solutions that they can live with every day. Mm -hmm. And whereas in a civil case, you're hoping it's done. They want to know just, I want to go away from this when it's over. Right. This is an ongoing thing. They have to be willing to stick with that agreement for a, a good while, at least until the kids are 18. Right. Yeah. So, the, so that's a tricky uh, part of that that I hear you saying, we're dissolving the relationship that's going to be ongoing. So right. it's sort of like dissolving the past? Yeah, well, it's dissolving. That's, that's a, a nice way to put it. It's the, the marriage relationship is dissolved, but they'll be related yeah. forever yeah. through the children. Uh, so yeah, that's, it's a new relationship that you're kind of creating. Mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily even want that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're hoping that it was over, but what really it is is taking a new shape. Okay, so yeah, so we could even almost say that you're the dividing line into the new, you right. know, here's what we're doing to dissolve the past, right. and here's how we're going to agree to approach the future. That's right. And yeah. we actually talk a lot about what is in the past. We, mm -hmm. we like to allow it to be there and say, what does your future look like? How do you want things to move forward? So let's talk about the length of those mediations, because uh -huh. I'm used to, so I, I do small claims, I do civil harassment. Uh -huh. Uh, small claims frequently is like an hour-ish, yeah, right? Yeah. And then civil is like two hours-ish mm -hmm. because it has all the relationship relationships if, right. issues. So how, how much does this uh, time frame expand in the family court? So if uh, here in Orange County, if we were doing a case that's given to us, there's usually only a, a couple topics that the judge is asking them to see a mediator for. So you will likely be about an hour, an hour and a half, and then that area is, we'll write the stipulation up for those things, send okay. it back to court. However, if you were doing an entire divorce, it's typically six hours, maybe a little more, depending yeah. on, on what level of um, dissolution is required. There's, if there's businesses involved and... and Lots of properties and so yeah. forth and uh, pensions and so all these things need to be broken down and understood and then make the steps forward. So, yeah, I've, I've had one go over 12 hours. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I can't imagine. I, I mean, I think it would have to maybe be that long. And it's usually two hour sessions because okay. everybody gets a little tired. Right. Uh, and they also usually need to come prepared. They need to get their documents in order. Mm -hmm. They need to understand if they're determining which holidays are with, are with mm -hmm. which parent, they want to have worked that out before we can write that stipulation. Right. And then um, what happens if they get that stipulation and then both parties want to change it? Do they come back to you? Do they... Well, Go back to the judge? Like, how, how does that work? If it's a simple change, it's easiest just to have the judge do it. Mm -hmm. They can quickly get it done. But that's, uh, we actually encourage them to make it a living document mm -hmm. so that they know as their needs change, rather than fight it out if, the, if something goes wrong, rework the agreement mm -hmm. and then get it set as part of their decree. So let's talk about the training side of that mediation. So when I think about family mediation, one of the assumptions I make is that you'd have to become m very familiar with that area. Um, is that a large component of the training or is it mostly about managing emotions or is it kind of everything? Uh, if, if you were to take the family mediation training right now, there are only gonna be certain areas that are unique. The idea that you're dealing with the, the relationship component mm -hmm. is where you want to start becoming really cognizant of the needs. Because, again, court, sit down, 
so how do we get here? What's going on? Mm -hmm. Uh, but this one, we're asking what their long-term goals are in a way. Mm -hmm. So they don't even know yet. They may right. be in the throes right. of those things. Hmm. So being willing to walk that path is one of the things that you want to learn while you're in that family mediation training. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily have to know a whole bunch of specific laws. Okay. Because whatever the dispute is, you're going to take time until it becomes clear for both parties. They don't even necessarily know mm -hmm. about what causes that dispute. Right. It's whether you can be a good mediator and walk that with them. Okay. And then how often, like percentage-wise, um, when you're doing a family case, mm -hmm. how often is a, an attorney present? If you're at the court, if, uh, it's probably close to half. Okay. They don't necessarily need to even be in the room, but we... If they're present because they're with their their uh, party, the interesting thing is I'll usually just ask the attorneys if we can meet with them alone, and I would say ninety percent of the time they're okay. They'll okay. they'll consult with them, but the attorneys are also actually sometimes helpful and they'll give us an idea of what they see are the main sticking points. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I've only had to had to do a full mediation with attorneys present twice. Really? Yeah. I thought it'd be much higher. The, is that because you, your style is to kick them out, or is that because they just generally... I ask them. Yeah. <laughs> I don't kick very hard. <laughs> you don't kick hard, but if you can nudge them out? Yeah. The, no, they've uh, always worked pretty well. Okay. Yeah. So they obviously can leave an, a, a consult an attorney if they need to of course, during that process. Of course. We recommend it. Sure. A, yeah. yeah. Before they're agreeing to mm -hmm. anything... We, mm -hmm. we want them because the attorney of record has to sign any stipulation anyway. So the attorney would roll it back right. pretty quickly if we. So it's like in it. everybody's best interest to have that attorney right. be at totally least aware. eyes on the document Absolutely. and giving yeah. the endorsement. Okay, yeah. interesting. Uh, so another thing I know about you is that you're bilingual. Uh huh. And so I would ask you, um, do you do mediations in, uh, it's Spanish, right? Correct. Okay. Do you know other languages besides Spanish? I've never asked you that. If I do, I'd just <laughs> use enough bad words or something, okay. something I shouldn't do in a mediation okay. anyway. So, yeah. so do you mediate um, in Spanish ever? Uh, I, I have done it, obviously, with translators, which mm -hmm. I know you've done. Uh, do you mediate in Spanish ever? And if so, when is that suitable? Yeah, I do. Um, specifically if both parties speak Spanish. Uh, it's kind of inappropriate if only one party speaks Spanish and mm -hmm. the other is English because now you've become an interpreter. And automatically, any bias that I have, not, not intentional, of course, but the way I think of words and then represent them mm. now becomes part of our process. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to be as you know, a, a window to let them see through rather mm -hmm. than um, like the smudges on the window that makes it hard for them to, right. to agree. So yeah, unless both parties speak Spanish, I, I would not mediate. I, I would ask for an interpreter. Yeah. And, and I've used interpreters. I know you have uh, that. It makes that makes a lot of sense to understand your role in that moment to say right. my role is not to do the interpretation it's to do the mediation. And so to the extent, or at least what I hear you saying is to the extent that I'm able to stay in that mediator role and speak in Spanish, that's fine. Right. Because they have for the capacity. Parties. Yeah. For both parties. And they can hear each other. So then you're not doing that interpretation. That's right. Uh, but, you know, that interpreter can play a role. Um, and just a side note for, for me is, you know, I've had a couple of cases where I think the interpreter maybe is a little fishy. I know I've seen cases yeah. where we had an interpreter, even in Spanish, yeah. and I'm hearing them say that that's not the words I would use to right. to relate that phrase right there. So it's like this, um, it's a, a challenge of maintaining that neutrality while still having an interpreter. It is. Uh, and so that I, I have one interpreter who's my favorite uh, mm -hmm. that I probably every few times get her in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I love is she's invisible. Mm -hmm. So I always feel like I'm hearing that person speak when she does the translation. Mm -hmm. 
And I said that to her one time. I said, gosh, you're, you're my favorite because I always feel like I'm really working with the parties. And she said, isn't that my job? And that truly is. And I said, well, yeah. And she said, well, then I should be good at that. And I said, yes, but I just want to let you know you, you actually are. Right. <laughs> because I, I feel like I can really mediate the same as I would in English. Right. So, And I'm not bilingual, so... And that's also why um, it's a little scary if the parties bring in their own interpreter mm -hmm. because they may kind of put a spin mm -hmm. on things and it's, the court will usually provide one that's a certified uh, interpreter. So that's right. kind of an important part. Unless it's an unusual, uh, unusual language. Right. Well, not unusual language. That's a terrible way to say it. Uh, less common. Less language. common. Correct. Less common. Right. So I had one in Czechoslovakian. Wow. Uh, and... Uh, that was less common. It's very less common. Yeah. So, um, anyway, uh, so you train mediators. Uh -huh. uh, tell us about that and tell us um, what you believe is the hardest area for a new mediator to learn. I love training new mediators. Uh, one of the things that I love about it is it, it never fails after about two or three days. Uh, we do a 40-hour uh, training, and after about two or three days, the mediator realizes how, sorry to say, how biased they are. Mm. And that's, that's actually a beautiful thing because yeah. they're able to start noticing their own bias, and that affects them in, in good ways for the rest of their lives. Not, a, not only in mm. those mediations, but how they relate to other people, how mm -hmm. they see themselves in the world. So, and I've had mediators or new mediators say, it's almost like going through therapy. You're learning so much <laughs> about yourself and you're understanding and you're understanding how to communicate differently. So yeah. it's a great process. Right. Um, as far as, what was the second part of your question? Oh, um, what, well, what's the hardest area? The so, hardest area. Um, so I don't know if that's the hardest area, maybe. No, but. that's actually the fun part. Um, <laughs> but the hard area is that as the, as the new mediators come through, they're so wanting to be these great mediators and fix. They want to fix. Mm, yeah. So they consistently want to get to what they think the problem is and then help them fix it. Right. And that's usually when you start missing all the important things. <laughs> missing the whole mediation, perhaps. In a way, yeah. yeah. So um, my goal for them is to learn to trust our process. Yeah. Always back up. Do not become right. part of the reason this isn't going well. But yeah. um, trust that step by step they're going to get to their own resolution. Yeah, that's interesting. So, so that's even on issue identification, right? That Absolutely. They, I mean, that can start very, very early. Can that, that mediator get into that uh, trap? So and, that's, that's and they, interesting. And they forget to do the things we tell them are number one, like restating and, yeah. and those very simple parts of the process that help things turn those wheels forward. And it's because they're thinking of how they're going to help fix it through the process. Right. Yeah. I have sometimes I'll be in mediations and, and a disputant will say, don't you think this is the problem? <laughs> and I'll, I'll have to, uh, you know, stop right there and uh -huh. like any inclination to say whether I think that or not and uh -huh. say it depends whether you think it is. Right. Right. This like, is... in other words, don't hand me the ball. I'm going to hand it right <laughs> back to you. And I, and I would say that's pretty typical of me as a mediator is right. to hand it right back. Whatever you give me. Right. I give you back because I don't want to be a player in the that's game. That's right. Right. I'm trying to help you play the game. That's right. Uh, and so that's that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, what advice would you give a new mediator? I know you give advice to mediators that you train. So what um, for this class? What would you say is are some things to consider? Um, number one, do trust the process. And number two, always f try to think of yourself as one of those parties. How would you want to be treated? Mm. golden rule type thing, right? right. Uh, because as a mediator, at times, you may feel like a little nudge one way or the other is helping them. Mm -hmm. But we never know their story. Right. We never really know all the things that are behind that. So it seems to us, in our limited view of, of their dispute, this is good for them. What we really want to do is make sure they have learned why it's good for them. Mm -hmm. and why they're agreeing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's being patient with that process 
and just treat them like you want to be treated. Be patient with them, that mm -hmm. type of thing. That's how I want to be treated. Yeah, I love the idea that you don't know the story. You and, never know the story. And that, I think, it comes with experience in mediating a lot of cases where you're really surprised by a new piece of, of uh, information that changes everything. Right. And that's, you know, I, you have roommates like dispute or, or you have business partners and then you find out that they never really were business partners or you have, I mean, it could be anything. Right. I, you know, I've had uh, a case. There's a relationship in their past yeah. somewhere that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had a case uh, a while back where uh, they failed to communicate and one party just said, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. And, find, and, and I was thinking in my mind, like, I don't get it. But then I thought, don't say that because you're siding. Right, just let them do their process. And the other dis disputant revealed a very compelling uh, explanation about an illness in her family that was prohibiting her ability to communicate. Wow! And uh, the the whole the whole thing changed. Yeah. They said, "Gosh, I can be way more accommodating. Yeah. I totally understand. I'm sorry." You know, like very different uh, change and never saw that. I never saw that coming. Right. But I was so happy I didn't get in the way. Right. So, you know, because she looked at me and said, you need to tell her to talk to me. You need to tell her to answer my emails. And I said, why don't you tell her about that? Right. And when they went back and forth, it was like, oh, my gosh, that's why this has all not been dealt with. And then right. they became very, very agreeable. And it was, you know... 15 minutes to the agreement, I think. It's really true. You know. um, when, when It's almost like sometimes they may hear it for the first time. Mm -hmm. They've been saying certain things, yes. especially in family cases. They've been saying it to each other for so long. And um, now a mediator does a restate, right? We, we hear the information and it says, it sounds like this is mm -hmm. what's been happening. And the other person says, is that what you meant all that time? Yeah. And it, it, yeah. it changes everything. Right. A chance for a little compassion or empathy for the other side, all of a sudden they start working together in ways that they didn't realize they would even want to. Right. Yeah. And I've had that also with emotions. I would kind of throw that topic into that conversation mm -hmm. to say, um, I've had people who are maybe settling debt or mm -hmm. um, a car accident or whatever and not realizing the other side's emotional reaction to right. that. Right, right. And then all of a sudden they're like, wow, I, I had no idea you were this upset about right. it. And sometimes as a mediator, you know, I, and a lot of my, you probably have this too with the ones that you train, where a lot of my mediators say, I kind of don't want emotion because it's too scary to right. deal with, right? Really I don't want to have it, you know, I don't want to have people get mad and I don't want to have people get sad, which are the two big ones that right. we get, right? right. And uh, not that you don't, you get everything, but, sure. uh, but, you know, or I'll have certain mediators that say, it's fine as long as nobody cries. Oh, okay. okay. And I'll say, well, except for that we're emotional people, so that's and not going to work. But And that's where they may be. Right. right. And yeah. so one of the things that, that I try to think about as a mediator is this notion of holding space mm. for emotion that needs to be considered. Mm. Um, and it's not, I'm not engineering that or saying, you know, I can't facilitate that. I can't trigger it. I'm right. not doing any of that. But if I see it and say, wow, this will promote a great amount of empathy or understanding like you're talking about, right. uh, I might hold space for it. In other words, allow it to happen rather wow. than rushing in and saying, anyway, we need a break I'm trying to or, change we topic, or we have to stop or we have to stop this line of questioning. Right. And so one of the, one of the uh, advice um, areas that I give new mediators mm -hmm. is sometimes when you're uncomfortable is when you need to stay in that space. Yes. Sometimes silence, just allowing things to settle with the group yeah. is exactly what's needed. So I would think in family, this would come up quite a bit. I mean, I yes. just all the range of emotion. Yes. Right. Because you have so many levels of potential disappointment and hurt and regret and right. everything, you know? So my suspicion would be that they haven't uh, held space no, as they, much for the other emotional usually, reaction. Yeah, right? Usually they're so quick to react towards each other. Um, uh, a very good friend of mine, mediator, she's, she's quick. And when she's doing her training to add that in a mediation, she can do exactly that. Hold space, be present and good restating listening skills. But with her husband of 36 years, <laughs> she knows what he's going to say and she's already <laughs> over it. And I mean, and this is a mediator. So, you know, it's, 
<laughs> we're all human. We all have that. And so that neutral is the one that is able to help something like that happen. So I'll be married 29 years coming up here, um, but I not 36, so I don't have that kind of uh, you know experience. Right. But I would uh, say I do understand the dilemma. Yes, for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's funny. Well, I think, and also I think that you know when we take on a role, I mean, as you're kind of uh -huh. suggesting, it it assumes that we take on a number of behaviors with that role, right? Or, mm -hmm. or suggests that we do mm -hmm. that, and so that I can see the dilemma for that person to transfer and say, oh. now I'm wife, forget it. I'm going to tell you what I think, right? Right, yeah. right. And you really can't, I mean, it's almost impossible to mediate your own dispute with mm -hmm. someone. You just have to be a good par partner or party in your own dispute. Right. Uh, because you're in it. Right, <laughs> so, right. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so, last question for you. Uh -huh. um, what are your thoughts about the future of mediation in California? Uh, in Southern California, where do you think we're going with this? I hear all the time it's you know growing and it's changing ADR and all these different things. Uh, thoughts about that? I, th I do think it's growing. Uh, I think what we're seeing, especially because there's things like restorative justice now taking root, uh, which is a form of mediation, but it's more like a, an entire process rather than mm -hmm. just uh, resolving one dispute. Uh, people are starting to look at how to handle conflict differently. Mm -hmm. uh, and mediation is not only sought out because it can be less expensive if it is right, divorce, right. but more importantly, if it's done well, they do have a better outcome. Yeah, It's better for the people that are part of it. Uh, so you asked about whether people can have a career. Yeah, you can be a highly successful divorce mediator Mm -hmm. just specializing in that. I mean, there's mm -hmm. plenty of people getting divorced. Right, so, right. So, yeah. So, yeah, I feel like people are trusting it more and more, mm -hmm. and we need quality mediators. Right. Not just someone that says, I can do that. Right, and that's, a, that's an important distinction that I uh, think you and I work on every day. Every day. As we train people, so. Yeah. All right, very good. Well, I'm going to stop this section. We have another section coming that I'm going to invite you to be a process of okay. uh, or, or part of that process. Uh, but thank you for the, the interview part You're and welcome. for coming in. Uh, love to hear about your practitioner role there. So that's a, an important thing to um, have on the show to consider and to kind of hear what the real world Real world. That's your world, is the real world, by the real way. Real world mediator OC. <laughs> <laughs> Mediating in the OC versus everywhere else is a exactly. great question, too. It's true. So. All right, very good. So for this last, last section, um, I, I have a new part of the, of the show that I'm going to introduce today, which is called Ask a Mediator. And uh, what this is, is a section where I'm going to take questions that have either been posted on the discussion board, uh, brought up an email, or just alluded to in any kind of way where we can identify different questions that have been asked that maybe don't hang together, but are just different questions and uh, have a chance to answer them. So I'm gonna invite you, Wesley, to be a part of that uh, process and we'll l try to answer some of these questions, um, I think both of us, as we would answer them. So let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so the, the new part of the show is to take questions that have come up in the course uh, so the first question I have is, what do you do when disputants don't have effective communication skills? That's most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, a lot of times it's helping. The first thing I want to do is help them understand what the process really looks like, how it works, because they're not going to be able to communicate on their own. Mm -hmm. Having a structure helps mm -hmm. them. So that, and then I do a lot of restating where mm -hmm. we're summing up what they're saying, giving it back to them. Because the other person, like I said, might be hearing it for the first time. Right, uh, let's see, so how would I answer that? I would say, um, yes, most of the time they don't have effective communication <laughs> skills. I guess for me, I think of it a little bit differently than that. I, I think that, mm -hmm. but I also think sometimes there might be even capacity issues of yeah. whether they can participate in the process at all. Um, so I've had some individuals with um, some mental challenges mm. and maybe not able to even represent themselves, mm. which is a dilemma. Yeah. And so, uh, so I'm kind of thinking about it, I guess, both ways to yeah. say there are people who simply just are, have Poor less skill. And then there's people that actually, uh, you know, 
right. maybe can't represent themselves. But the, right. the question I'm asking is, can this be a fair process for that person is, is something I always think about as a mediator, right. right? So if somebody mentally can't track with what we're doing or doesn't have the ability uh, that I wonder about mediation as a process for them if they can't be equally helped, right? Yes. Yeah. So they have to be able to participate fully on their own. Right. Yeah. To make their to be voluntary, they have to actually be completely in it. Right. Right. If, if you're limited how you're able to participate, that's not that's not really you saying yes. That's the part of you that was still there. I had recently. Yeah. I was in a civil case, uh -huh. and uh, the disputant got very very upset with me. Okay. And started pointing her fingers at me and pounding the table and yelling at me. And I know, it just happens, right, in doing business. And uh, so uh, she, she, you know, was very angry about how it was going. She said she was no longer going to win, which wasn't what we were doing anyway. <laughs> I know you appreciate that, right? And, uh, and so one of the things that was interesting is, is after she left, there were a couple of observers in the room who were training for mm -hmm. mediation. And they said, wow, we can't believe how poor the communication skills are here. And I said, are we surprised? Right. I mean, we, we can't I mean, be totally surprised that you needed to have a third party stranger help you. They're in conflict. Right. You couldn't work it out. And right. so now we're going to invite someone who you never met before. <laughs> right. Who at least has training, but will be helping you. And that's kind of, you know, right. kind of an interesting thing to think about. Yeah. A lot so. of times those people have had conversations with the other party, yeah. but only in their mind. Right. Right. They've worked it all. Why yeah. this won't work and everything in their mind. They've never actually taken the time to try a meaningful conversation. Right. So we may be that first time it's happened. Yeah, and I, I would say about 50% of the time in small claims, uh -huh. people haven't, is that what you'd say about they yeah. haven't communicated about yeah. half or the time, really which is poorly, startlingly sure. high to me. Yeah, yeah. Or poorly, yeah, yeah, poorly executed. A lot of people are afraid of how they'll actually act if they were to confront or even if it's in a useful way, mm -hmm. how they're going to be with that person. They'll lose their temper, so they've avoided, mm -hmm. and now they're in court. Right. So. And I, I think about that all the time, too, because I think we're in an era of texting, uh -huh. emailing. Like, it, it couldn't be easier, really, right? If in terms of make, portability, right, of the message. If you to make message. it happen, you, there's a way to do it now. Yeah. Right. And then, uh, so instead of that, it's like what you said, you, that avoidance bought you yes. a formal, structured conversation with that person. Yes. So avoiding really didn't work out as a strategy, no. you know, which is kind of interesting. If they did the math, they would, but they don't understand the math, so. Right. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Um, what do you do when parties are crafting a bad decision? Do you want to go first on that one? <laughs> uh, well, the, the comment I would make first is there are no bad decisions if I am the one judging that. And so that's a tricky one that I think is very frustrating for mediators is that some parties will agree to a resolution or settlement mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. they like that I might not like. Mm -hmm. And so part of the question becomes who's judging it as bad? Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, I guess, where I'd start with it. What would, what would you add? I, I fully agree. I've actually mediated cases that I, I watched what was happening and realized this really isn't, in my opinion, mm -hmm. fair. Yeah. But it's where they are. That's the challenging part. So as a mediator, my best job is just to check in yeah. and maybe caucus even to see that they're actually comfortable. Right. Even if it's an uncomfortable situation. They're right. cognizant and aware. And it's it was their dispute to begin with and it'll be their agreement. Right. So they own all parts yeah. of that process. Yeah. You know, that's interesting to think about a caucus there because I was thinking about when you're talking about the testing the settlement, which we talk mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. in the later stages of mediation, mm -hmm. saying, you know, what will happen if this Right. You know, what happens if you guys agreed to pay each other on the 4th of every month? What do you do about 4th of July? Right. Or Reality check. Yeah, right. do yeah. the reality testing. And uh, so we do all these different things in mediation to do that. And so I was thinking that that actually is a great one to think about using a caucus format to say, hey, so how are you feeling about this? Right. You know, what are your well, concerns? Kind of checking, checking it for its durability. And it's more important in family situations because if mm -hmm. the emotions are high and they're now started to what we would call retreat, mm -hmm. they're just giving, giving, giving um, anything that the other party's oh, expecting. Okay. Yeah. 
then it's okay for a mediator to make sure we're keeping it as balanced as we can mm -hmm. to say, hey, we're going to take a break, you know, and then we talk to each party separately. Mm -hmm. And they still may go there, mm -hmm. but you've, you've done your due diligence by making sure they're aware as much as you can mm -hmm. of what's happening. I'm thinking about one case I had one time. Um, it was in civil harassment. It was a neighbor-neighbor dispute. Uh -huh. And they had been feuding for about four years, uh -huh. many calls to the police, uh -huh. you know, lots of, it's something pretty typical that we see in that court. I know you've been in that court. Uh -huh. uh, one of their solutions they put on the table was to build a fence together for three weeks. And they had engaged huh. in very negative interactions leading up to that. Yeah. And so I said, so given the fact that you for the last 40 minutes have described the negative Awful. interactions you've had, <laughs> and I mean negative is like very, very lovely way to say it. Uh -huh. uh, how do you feel about working face to face on a project together on your joint property lines? And one of them said, oh my gosh, that's a terrible idea. But I wasn't trying to engineer that. I just said, you know, how do you, like, you're talking about a very big change in communication. What do you think about that? Right. Um, because I thought to myself, oh no. Like someone might get hurt here, you know. <laughs> start like I don't know. Yeah. At each other <laughs> I don't know. A nail gun. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, and that's that's where you have to be careful. I think there's a line to think about as a mediator yeah. to say, "Wow," because I thought immediately that's a bad decision, you know. But right. it wasn't. It, you know, you just have so to you check, it, check and you, it. Absolutely. Yeah, and you put it in front of them and say, given the context yeah. that you provided and a four-year history. Right of this, um, is this something you think? How, how does that look? That's what we like to say. How does that look, uh, you know, and, and also, um, do, you, do you think there might be bumps and what might those be mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. you could anticipate them? Mm -hmm. And uh, then the, the one disputant said, wait, we can't do that. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, what do you want to do then, <laughs> right? Um, okay, so next question, uh, let's see here. Oh, how do you keep it neutral? Well, I can keep myself neutral. Okay. The, the mediation, I try to keep as much as I can that uh, the amount of time I'm giving both parties mm -hmm. is equal, um, that the attention I'm paying to both of them, when I restate things here, it sounds like mm -hmm. I'm being fair and the same mm -hmm. with them. So the way I'm participating with them, I'm gonna make sure is neutral. Uh, and a balance of power if someone's mm -hmm. really trying to be overwhelming. Which definitely happens. Definitely happens. Uh, you can use things like taking a break and something mm -hmm. to let it cool or calm down or try to bring both people back in a different way. But in a way, it's kind of like we never really can keep it truly neutral. What we can try to do is keep it moving, mm -hmm. in my opinion, because once they once they start moving in the same direction towards a resolution, mm -hmm. that is the neutralizer. That's when they actually start owning right. and wanting to go ahead. Right. Up until then, if their positions are, are just yeah. super hard, you can't change their position. You can right. open up to interests. So. so something you just said reminded me of another concept that's relate, highly related to this, which mm. is equality, because mm. um, you were kind of putting them both together, because I think they go together in mm -hmm. mediation. Mm -hmm. And one of the concepts that I teach my students is it's not equality, it's the perception of equality. Right. And that sounds so fishy and terrible. And so some, immediately I'll get a hand up in the air saying, that's a terrible idea. You need to treat everyone equally. And what I say and as a mediator is it's impossible to do that. Uh, right. So I can't give you the exact number of seconds to speak and then the other one the exact number of seconds. Right. What I can do is give you the perception that you have an equal voice Right. and the option to have that voice. So one of the dilemmas that happens often for me is, um, and you've seen this very often in mediations too, where you have one person who talks a lot yes. and one who doesn't talk a lot, right. right? And so one of the strategies that I like to talk about there is to say, I need for that introverted person or less extroverted person mm -hmm. to believe they have as much of a voice as they would like to have. As they want to have, that's right. Right, so what I might do to give that perception of equality, because mm -hmm. that other person's gonna fill the space. If mm -hmm. I, you know, so mm -hmm. I might do more closed questioning on that side mm -hmm. just to keep the story smaller. Uh, yeah, in that container. <laughs> right, which never happens. No. And then, uh, well, not never, but, right. you know. 
Um, and then on the other side, asking more open questions or saying, is there anything else you'd like to, to add? Draw out. That's anything right. else you want to tell us? Anything else that you think is important to the case? Right. And I feel like that is a way to, you, you can't make it equal. And even the less extroverted person doesn't even want to be right. equal. You know, they're like, I'm good. I summarized it. I've said what I would like to say. Right. Uh, and so then I, I try to, as a mediator, give a strategy there, you know, to kind of facilitate that. But And caucus can work in yeah, that, too. for um, sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good comment. Even, even for the party that's very verbose, mm -hmm. um, if it's five minutes with the verbose and five minutes with the other, that, that helps them say, oh, I'm being treated the same. Right. So they may... Um, mitigate or or start to shift how they're looking at things and start saying oh i guess i'm just part of this process right. i'm not the owner of this process right so yeah um i had a funny thing happen uh i think a month ago or so i was in civil harassment and where there's so much storytelling uh -huh. <laughs> and i said to the disputant i just need you to give me four or five sentences that summarize why we're here today uh -huh. just an overview so we can get kind of a general view uh -huh. And she said it all started on a Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh no, it all started on, and it was just like download of information. And I was like, oh no, like it all started on a Thursday. The level of detail coming, I'm in She'd deep been trouble. She's been for months. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, truly, truly. Okay, next question. Um, okay, so what's your advice in handling emotions in mediation? You heard I talked a little bit about my perspective. What about yours? Uh, the way I, I typically will handle emotions are, number one, is this something that registers as so important that, they, that to not have space to do that, they won't feel like they're fully in this. Mm. They need that permission, mm -hmm. even if it's difficult for the other party to hear. Mm -hmm. um, after that, then it, there are times people can use emotion oh, yeah. to manipulate, sure. to try to give the impression that they've really been worked over and so forth. Mm -hmm. And so if it's disingenuous, we don't necessarily need to spend a lot of time trying to console or, or something like that. What, what we want to do is make sure that they're allowed an equal voice, like mm -hmm. we talked about. Um, but I'm personally okay if they're expressing emotion. I want to make sure that that it's still a communication mm -hmm. rather than just an outburst. So how do you know the difference between the disingenuous emotion and the, the visceral one? Like, I, I, well, and this is something I intuition? think I'm just, uh, almost, it's almost, uh, you know, and I guess in a way I'm kind of being a judge of it, but what I'm trying to do is make sure that the process is being given its full breadth. Mm. especially in a family case, mm -hmm. uh, because that may be why they take the next step. Okay. They're realizing this is painful and I want to move. I want to move forward. Well, I don't know what it's going to be. Interesting. But I'm, I'm personally okay. As far as whether it's genuine or disingenuous. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think a lot of it times it's in their energy. It's kind of like their body tells you whether it's like they're putting something into it. Mm -hmm. You can see the reaction from the other party. Yeah, uh, true. You, you, you start getting a sense of it. And so that's where a good reflection, you can give it back to them. Yeah. And it kind of catches them and, and they almost hear what they're saying and doing a little. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, every case is yeah, its own thing. Yeah, every case is different because every human's different. Yeah, uh, one, how about you? One part that is occurring to me, well, just a related topic, uh -huh. is when you paraphrase or reflect back the emotions right. you believe you're seeing right. and how terribly difficult that is on the mediator's part. <laughs> so if they're, if they're crying and you say, I see you're a little upset right now, right. your underestimation of that is going to probably Agreed. get a very bad reaction. Agreed. Or right. if you say, I see you're hysterical now. Right. Right. So the terminology used on the part of the mediator to yeah. reflect back those you, emotions. You I mean, I find sometimes I won't even say what I saw. I'll say, how do you react to this? Right. To my other dispute, so only because I'm across. I'm just not even sure if there's an accurate way to say 
obviously this person's devastated. Do I use the word devastated? You know, I, I don't use that word. <laughs> <laughs> right. But I mean, the, it's difficult. Right. It's a difficult thing. Yeah. A generic for myself would be something like, I see this is very upsetting for you. Mm -hmm. Upsetting's the bucket for a bunch of things. That's probably good. That's right. probably a good word. And then if something more comes out at that time, then you can reflect on the things that caused it. Mm -hmm. And that, that can start those wheels turning for both. Right. Now they're connecting to what the root of that emotion is. You're not meant to address the emotion directly. Right. You're meant to help them connect with the root enough to make the decision about what they want to do now, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Yeah, that's interesting. And so the, then that, that goes back again to the role clarification, saying yeah. I'm not here to counsel you right. or to be your psychologist and get your shame triggers taken right. care of today or right. whatever. <laughs> you know, that's I have Brene to... Brene Brown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I love Brene Brown. I love Brene. She's <laughs> so, awesome. You know, She's great. We can talk about her today. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah, that's interesting. All right. Well, very good. Well, these uh, are our questions for today. So I think we covered it. And uh, very much appreciate you being here today. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. So once again, um, thank you for joining us today. Um, it was my pleasure to previously interview Wesley, and I thank him for his participation in our program and for enlightening us on some of his experiences. So as we sign off today, I'm Dr. Pamela Kreiser, wishing you peace. Mm -hmm.